Good morning, everybody. If you're watching us online, good morning to you. Especially to Mama Sue Westfall. Thanks for tuning in. All righty. So um, it's been a very heavy past two, three, four weeks for me. And, and you think about just the fact that, you know, we're a very small congregation. And, and then we lose two people. It's like, God, what is going on? Because, God, you promised us that we're going to grow. God, you promised us that there's going to be a lot of amazing things you're going to do here. And uh, the interesting thing is that I think it was a week after uh, Mary went to be with the Lord, um, I was ministered to, and I was told that the Lord is going to give you more campuses. And I'm like, yeah, I keep hearing that, and yet we just (laughs) lost somebody. (laughs) It's like, God, what are you doing? One thing that I have come to understand about the ways of God is that We can never fully understand the ways of God, but we can trust His Word. His Word is true, but His ways can never be understood. That's why there is no one formula for how the Holy Spirit operates. I've been in teachings where they're like, yep, this is how you receive the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit works, but He always surprises us. Why? Because He cannot be boxed. Can you imagine boxing God? He would cease to be God. You will end up becoming God, right? But our God we serve, his word is true. And as I was grieving the the home return of Mary and Chelsea, the Lord brought to mind this this quote here that has always, always spoken to my heart. And it's a quote that I came across just, I think it was about maybe three years ago. I was in a class called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, and I was just thinking about how the world is not fair and how things just happen in ways that we don't expect it to. And this really blessed me. It says, some I bless with things. Some I allow to be persecuted. Some I bring home early. Eventually, all who love me come into my presence. And then I get to show off my mercy and grace forever and ever. It's all a part of a beautiful stained glass window which reveals my glory. Isn't it beautiful? That we can trust that our God's plan will not be derailed and that it doesn't matter what it looks like. In my life, God's plan is playing out. And the thing is that sometimes when the enemy thinks he's, he's like, the enemy thinks he's gotten us He doesn't realize that he is playing into God's plan. No, he he he, he, that's how it is. Because when Jesus was crucified, they thought that was it. That's it. But on the third day, and, and, and if the enemy knew that Jesus would rise up from the grave, he would not crucify him. But when Jesus was crucified. The disciples, they had banked all their hopes on this man. It's like somebody tells you, this crypto, we're going to the moon. And you sell your house, and you throw the money in, and you wake up the next day, and the crypto has gone to zero. That's how they felt. Why? Because they had been left, they, they had to pretty much abandon their families to be with Jesus. They had to give up who they were to be with Jesus. And people thought they were crazy. Oh, they think the Messiah is here. Their Messiah rides on a donkey. What kind of Messiah rides on a donkey? Just think about it. You know, it's easy for us to read it right now and just gloss over it. You see, yeah, 12 disciples, they followed Jesus, and Jesus rose again. But there's, there's a lot of details that we don't realize. The rejection, the betrayal, the pain, the despair. What did we just do? But then Jesus rose up from the grave. Jesus rose up from the grave. Today, my sermon title is do your worst. I, I, I feel like it's a day when, or a season when fun titles, 
I'm not interested in fun titles. I just want to go straight to the point. I believe that, and I know, I don't only believe it, I know that every believer faces moments of intense trials. If you're not going to trials right now, then maybe you're a one-year-old. Even my, my two-year-old feels like she goes to trials when I tell her to go to bed. <laughs> she feels like it's a trial. And in the moment of trials, the enemy seems to be doing his worst at you. And as you're going through it, you feel your spirit is crashing, and you feel like there's no hope. But one thing I know and I know is that you and I, we have been called to stand firm in the middle of any and every storm that the enemy will throw at us. You will go through storms in life. That's why Psalm 23, even though it says all these amazing things, he prepares a table before me, my cup will run over, uh, 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 and all these things. He says, even though I escape from the valley of the shadow of death, right? No. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess who's with me? Jehovah is with me. So the troubles will come. The troubles don't mean that you're making mistakes, you're sinning, and that's why God is punishing you. Sometimes that's what we think. And we, and we start to reflect, what did I do wrong? Maybe when I was five years old, I stole candy. That's why this is happening to me at the age of 54. <laughs> Folks, life just happens. Life just happens. Why? Because we live in a broken world. We live in a world where our spirit within us is testifying that we don't belong here, and our spirit is yearning for a time when we will be united to our Savior. We will be united in the kingdom of God where there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain, for the former things will pass away. But until then, you and I, we will go through storms. There will be times when storms will shatter you from all sides, and you will feel like you are alone. You might be going through that season, and I want to let you know that you are not alone. You are not alone. We're called to stand firm, even in the middle of the storm. Today, I want us to draw strength and inspiration from the life of David. David is an interesting guy. There was a season in David's life where he was deeply distressed. He was a broken man. But in defiance of all that was going around him, the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so today's sermon, I want us to just look at life with defiance and say to the the storms of life, do your worst, for my God will do his too. Do your worst, my God will do his. The enemy may be attacking your marriage. Now, Now is not the time to say, oh, woe is me. Oh, God, please, if you can, no. Stand up in boldness. And speak to that situation. Why? Because we have power and authority in Jesus. Now, if it's my personal power, then I got to be scared. Because I ain't got no power. I, I, I struggle to even, I don't lift dumbbells, but if I ever try, I struggle to lift them. I have no power. Even though my, my, my son is starting to realize that daddy doesn't know everything and is not the strongest. But I think Selma still thinks I'm the strongest. But I know and I know that I am not strong. But my reliance is on God's power. That's why, I, that's why I must lift my head up. I must rise up and walk through the valley of the shadow of death because he is with me. The storms will come. All right, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And God's word says, and David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. 
because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. So David, as we all know, was a king that had been anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. And you would think right after the anointing, it's all going to be fun. Everything is going to be great. Why? Because that's what God said about his life. You will be the next king of Israel. Let me tell you something. When you receive a prophetic word, that is the season and the time you got to pray. That is the season and the time when you got to delve deep into the Lord. Because guess what? The enemy is now aware of the plans of God for your life. And so he is going to launch cannonballs at you. He is going to come with the RPGs, the AK-47, all kinds of grenades at you. That's why when you receive a word of the Lord, you receive an encouragement. Don't just go relax and eat pizza. Pizza is good. But go on your knees and pray. (laughs) Why? Because every promotion comes with battles. That's the reality. Every promotion. There's a reason why when you are not in Christ, sometimes things seem to be going all right with you, for you. You don't face any challenges. You don't face any spiritual attack. You don't face, people don't even talk about you because you are in sync with the status quo. But God forbid you decide that I'm going to live for Christ. Huh. You'll see what will happen. Family will stand against you. Friends will come against you. So when I was in college, people would be brokenhearted and start weeping whenever their girlfriends would get baptized. (laughs) Because it means your girlfriend is not going to be serious about Jesus. And so your relationship status could be a little shaky. (laughs) Okay, that's not, a, that's not the right joke for this today. All right, let's... Now you guys got to help me. Just pretend it's funny and laugh, you know. <laughs> so David receives the promise and the anointing to be king. And right after that, the current king, Saul, sees him as a threat. And so... We see David spending years on the run, hiding from Saul and his army, a man anointed by God to be king. And here he is living in the wilderness, pursued by the king, King Saul. And in 1 Samuel chapter 27, the Bible says, David, tired of constantly fleeing from Saul, decides to seek refuge in the land of the Philistines. Can you believe it? This is the guy who killed Goliath, who was a Philistine. And now God's promise about him, he's waiting for it. But he has to go to, he's got to go so low. Sometimes life will just make you just go to your lowest. Yeah, but don't stay there. So David ends up with the Philistines. So he goes to, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's, it's Akish. Back in the seminary, they didn't teach us how to pronounce biblical names, so just bear with me. So he, he goes to Akish, the king of Gath, which is kind of like a province of, uh, of the land of Philistine. And the king of Gath, Akish, likes David so much that he gives David and his men at the town of Ziglag to stay at. And I believe it was the favor of the Lord which gave David, which, which made it possible for the king to give David Ziglag to stay at. Because your enemies usually don't like you. It's sad that Christians have enemies, but if you have an enemy, I'm sure you don't like them. Right? Okay, no, no one is really willing to talk to you. <laughs> so I'll just kind of gently weave out of that. Okay. I pray that you forgive them, that the Lord will work on your heart. Amen? Amen. All right. (laughs) So this is what King David would do. Of course, David is an Israelite. And so he is loyal 
to God's people. But here is the situation where he's staying in Ziklag with the Philistines, and he had to pretend to be loyal to them. But this is what he would do. He stayed there for over a year, and they would conduct raids against some of the Philistine people while pretending to be loyal to them. And there was a time when they, prepared, they were preparing for a major battle against Israel. The Philistines were. The Philistines were. And David and his men were initially included in the army. They were actually going to fight on the side of the Philistine because they were staying there. They had no other option. They were actually willing to do it. Why? Because Israel was pretty much against them because of the king. However, the Philistine commanders mistrust in David. I'm glad they did because it's possible David would have changed his mind. Mistrust in David sent David and his men back to Ziklag. Like, nope, we want nothing to do with you. We don't trust you. So when David and his men returned to, returned to Ziklag in 1 Samuel chapter 30, they found that this wonderful group of people called the Amalekites had raided the town of Ziklag. They had burned it to the ground and had taken all the women and children captive including David's two wives. What a very difficult situation. And these men, about 600, were men that had sworn allegiance to David. They believed in God's promise over David's life. And so they had left Israel with David and were all on the run from King Saul. They believed that God's word about David was true. But here is a situation that when The Amalekites raided Ziglag and took away everything from them. They were very angry with David. And they talked of stoning David, blaming him for their loss. And the Bible says David was deeply distressed. Because back then it wasn't like now that you could say, well, the law says you can't kill me. If you try to kill me, I'll call the cops. No, they will stone you. (laughs) No cop will come and save you. That's the reality. And so mob justice was a serious thing back then. If people threaten to stone you and you don't escape, they will actually go through with it. And so David was deeply distressed. It wasn't like he could just get on a horse and just gallop away. He, they would chase him down because these were men who had lost everything. They had not only lost everything following David, but now they had lost the little that they had. Because they were following David. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I, I just want to read a, uh, a different version here that says, But David found strength in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And because he found strength in the Lord his God, What did David do? He sought guidance from the Lord. He went to the priest, and the priest sought God's will on David's behalf. And they inquired, and the Lord told David, pursue, and you will overcome. And that is exactly what happened. David got his strength from God. David ended up having a renewed strength because he sought the face of the Lord. This story highlights reliance on God even in the darkest storms of life. And it serves as an example to you and I on how to find strength in God. A lot of times we rely on our strength. And like I said, your strength, my strength will always fail us. The reality is that we find ourselves right in the middle of a spiritual warfare. It is a spiritual warfare that seeks to destroy destinies. It is a spiritual warfare that seeks to isolate and devour. And that is why you and I, we cannot rely on the arm of the flesh. It's like someone with a dagger going to a war with someone holding a bazooka. Not going to work. And so if you rely on your strength, that is the picture of what is actually happening. And David 
relied on the Lord for his strength, for wisdom, for direction, notwithstanding everything that was happening. I know as a church family, we're going through a season. But I'm done saying, oh, God, why is this happening? I'm, I'm done. Because, first of all, I did not call myself. God called me. You did not call yourself to be a Christian. God called you. And so, if you look at the storms of life, if you focus on the things that are happening, what's going to happen is that those things will become magnified above the God who called you. And I have never seen any situation where a problem was ever bigger than God. Because he created everything. Everything you and I see, God made it. And so if he can make it, why is he not in control? He is in control. In the good and in the bad. That's why he says give thanks. Why? Give thanks doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge what, what's going on. That's not what it means. Give thanks doesn't mean that, yep, I'm just going to deal. No. Give thanks mean that, God, I am putting my trust in you. God, you are going to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above all that I can think. Lord, it may not happen the way I want it to happen, but Lord, your plan is playing out. And so because of that, I can stand and look at the storm and say, do your worst. Do your worst. You have not seen my God move. You don't know the promises of God about my life. Do your worst. God's purpose will be established. Do your worst. You know, the phrase do your worst is not an a, a expression of defeat. It is a bold defiance. It doesn't mean I'm giving up. It is the stance of a believer who knows that your God is greater than any enemy, greater than any trial, greater than any storm that comes your way. Do your worst. Do your worst. Folks, we must always remember and not forget the goodness of God. In order to encourage yourself, we, I, I want you to just think about all the blessings of God. It's like, you know, us human beings, we're, we're, we're interesting. It's kind of like reputation. Someone is a great person, does one mistake, and they use that one mistake to condemn them for the rest of their lives. Sometimes that's kind of like how we view God. We forget about the good things that he has done. And then when that one trouble hits us, like, yep, God is not good anymore. Like, God, yep, this problem is definitely bigger than you. Just one time. Or maybe even two times or maybe even three times, or maybe even four times, or five times, but count your blessings. Count your blessings. You remember those times when you were in a different kind of storm and you thought nothing, nobody can save you, but then God came through for you. Was he, did God change then? He is the same yesterday, today, now, and forevermore. That is the God we serve. That is the God I serve. His word is true. His word is true. Perhaps you're, you're facing some kind of pain or sickness in your body. And everybody has prayed. The Pope has prayed. The Archbishop has prayed. You've gone to Israel to bathe in the Jordan. You've drunk olive oil. The elders have prayed. Your kids have prayed. Who else hasn't prayed? Yourself. Well, yeah, maybe. You gotta, maybe you got to pray for yourself. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, maybe you got to pray. 
That's a good one. Because sometimes, <laughs> oh, you're giving me a new sermon to preach. <laughs> Before you ask people to pray for you, pray for yourself. <laughs> See, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. David didn't wait for somebody else to encourage him. He encouraged himself. In the Lord. And folks, I, I will admit, as a, as a pastor, I don't know everything. I don't understand everything. There, 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 there are things in the Bible that I read that personally I don't understand, and that is the reality. Why? Because... He is God. Now, if I write a book like this, you'll fully understand it. But if God writes something like this, we can't fully understand it, but we can understand it. Why? Because we seek him, and his Holy Spirit directs us and gives us wisdom. But the reality is that I don't know all things. And, and I, sometimes I don't know why God heals this person and doesn't heal that person. And I share with you my personal example where a lady was about to be pulled off life support when my first wife, Lauren, was sick. And I prayed. And it was reversed. The person came back. And then a few days later, my wife went to be with the Lord. I had prayed. I had fasted. I had went when. When Cassie and I lost, uh, when Ka Cassie and I lost weight, geez, what am I talking about? When Cassie and I met, I was super skinny because I had been in a season of fasting and praying. And, and I'm sure the people at the hospital thought I was crazy because I would just go to a family room and just be praying and declaring God's blessings and God's healing and everything. It has never changed the fact that I know God heals because I see him heal every day. But there are situations and instances that you and I don't understand. We will never understand why, because you and I are not God, but we can trust God. We can trust that his perfect will will be done and that nothing surprises God. That is why when I look at what is happening in our world today, I know my God is not surprised. He is not shocked. He's not like, oh, what are we going to do? No. He is not surprised. I don't even know where I'm at in my sermon. I want to encourage you to stand firm. Don't let the storms of life make you forget about the promises of God over your life. Go back to the promises. Don't let the storms of life make you forget about the promises of God for your life. Sometimes you got to pick up those old notebooks when God spoke to you. That's what I do. Every prophetic words spoken over my life, spoken over my, life, uh, uh, over my ministry, spoken over my family. I always go back to it. And this week, I did a lot of that because I was in pain. I was in such brokenness and pain that for the first time in however long, I didn't come to work on Monday because it manifested physically as sickness. And I'm someone that I, I'm a workaholic. I'll come in even if my leg is, is cut off. Why? Because for me, it's like there, there are more important things. But I was a broken man. And what I did was that. I'm thankful to everybody who reached out and sent me encouraging messages just with everything that's going on. I went back to God's word concerning my life. And I played them over. And I played them over. And I played them over. Why? Because... It reminded me of the promises of God. I can fail you in my promises, but God's promise is true. He's got a track record. Look at your life. God is faithful. He's been faithful to you and I. And one thing about brokenness and pain and storms of life is that if we give it to God, he will use it for his glory. Every brokenness. You look at this beautiful thing here. These are broken glasses. Redeemed and used 
for something beautiful. That's what God will do with your story. You might have gone through a divorce. Maybe the only person in your family who has gone through a divorce. You might have made a mistake that, that has destroyed your life, that people look at you and judge you. I am so thankful that God does not need people's opinions Amen. to do wonders in my life. Who I'd be in trouble. People will be writing letters. God, you know this dude? He's not, he doesn't like people sometimes. Why should you bless him? But God doesn't need people's opinions. And that's the reality. And so if you focus on what people think about you, trust me, you're in trouble. If you focus on your brokenness, you're in trouble. If you focus on the past betrayals, the past hurt, the past things that people have said about you, you will always be in chains. But see, when you give it up to God, and you look at the storm and say, no, this is not where God wants me to be. There's more that God has for me. God, I submit my life to you. Lord, take these broken, em- these broken pe- pieces of my life, these dying embers of my life, and use it for your glory. Guess what he does? Dad. If I bring you a plain glass, no matter, no matter how colorful it is, you would not take that over this. Why? Because there's an intricate, intentional design to this that makes it art, makes it valuable. That's what God is doing, will do, and wants to do in your life and my life. Don't let the storms knock you down. Look at the storm and say, do your worst. Do your worst. I will do mine. I'll do mine not because I have power. I'll do mine because I'm going to submit it to God. I'm sorry if I'm all over the place. I don't even, I'm, I'm just going to try and just, and just go through this. I, one more thing before I conclude. Friends, let's not play dead. There are some animals when threatened, they play dead to avoid being harmed. I think most of them usually get eaten. (laughs) They don't. Well, but they still get eaten though. Well, I don't want to be that guy who plays dead and gets unlucky and gets eaten. (laughs) Everybody can play dead. So I've noticed something about me. Since I gave my life to Jesus, there are many things people would do and get away with. When I do it, I get caught. Should I say this? Oh, man, you guys are excited to, to, to hear about my dirt. No, we're not going to talk about that. When I was in grad school, maybe if I get a Tesla today, I'll, I'll, I'll share that story. So, so when I was in grad school, so one of the gifts that God has given me is the gift of writing. And I'm so thankful to my parents. My dad is a writer. And my mom, growing up, I, I was an athlete. I had athletic abilities. 100 meters it was pretty easy for me. But my parents, like most African parents, want you to either be a doctor or a lawyer. Every other thing is a failure. <laughs> Can you imagine telling your dad, Dad, I think I want to be a comedian? An African dad. <laughs> you are crazy. <laughs> so I had the gift of writing, but I was at a point in grad school. When I say grad school, seminary, studying theology, I decided to take a shortcut because somehow I wanted to graduate quickly, and so I lumped up a bunch of classes. I think I was taking maybe four four classes every year. I took four classes 
um, uh, the first year and then the half of the year and then the last semester, I decided I was just gonna just bunch it all together instead of having one more semester. So instead of it being two and a half year program for me, I was just gonna do it in two years. And so I think it was maybe I was doing six or seven classes and I have papers to write in grad school. If you know me, I'm always trying to come up with solutions. So I thought it would, you know what? It would be great if I, it, 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 you know what? This is an easy fix. For my book reviews, instead of reading the book, who wants to read, right? When I can binge watch on Netflix. <laughs> I, I would go to Google and look up the reviews for the books. And I would copy all, if you're in college, don't do this. You will be caught and I pray you get caught. Because you will learn like I did. So I would copy all the book reviews, paste them in Word, and I have a gift of just syncing things together. And you cannot track it. So I, I, I did that for like the first two months. Everything was great, you know. Hey, God is blessing me, right? <laughs> Until. <laughs> One assignment. I attached, so I would have two, docu two Word documents, one with the, with the pasted uh, reviews from people, and the other document is the one that I'm just doing my own artistic stuff, you know, synthesizing and everything. I attached the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Till date, I don't know how that happened, because they were in two different folders. I am sure I did not attach that. But somehow it was attached. And I don't even know where, why am I even going, where am I going with this story? But anyway, <laughs> I guess I wanted to give you some dirt on me that you can use later on. But anyway, so I, I attached it. And then about an hour later, I get a response from the professor. Gosh, I have never felt my world come crashing down like that before. Because I was probably like a month or two away from graduating. My parents were going to come for the graduation. All the way from, I think they were in Niger or Burkina Faso then. They were going to come. My fiance then, Lauren, was excited. Everybody was proud of me. I'm about to graduate. The professor reaches out and lets me know what I have done and that he would have to uh, speak with the school board or something about that. And I was a graduate assistant for this professor I loved so much. He was a mentor, and he was the head of whatever board it is that reviews. And this guy always calls me his star student. Love me! Not knowing his star student was a criminal. <laughs> and so he lets him know, and my favorite professor that I was a graduate assistant for says, we need to have a conversation. And gosh, the long and short of it was that, you know me, I'm always trying to find solutions. <laughs> God is merciful. God is merciful. I just had the wisdom to review, because they were pretty much going to give me an F for that class. It didn't matter what I did. I was going to fail that class, which means I, would, I wouldn't graduate. I would have to wait for the next semester to take that one class. And they were now reviewing to see if I had done it in the other classes. And thankfully, it was just that class in particular. And so I'm so thankful to God. And so I told them, and then I, I, I did a little research, and I was like, hey, I reached out to my dean. I was like, hey, I took this similar class back in undergrad. Can, will the transfers transfer over? And I remember the dean laughing because he... <laughs> He knew of the situation, and by God's grace, he said yes, and they showed mercy. I did get an F, and some of my grades for some of the other classes were reduced because they were like, it's possible that you, you, you did this. It was reduced. And so my credit, my final credit, whoo. Anyway, why did I even start this? <laughs> God is merciful, right? I don't know, but... But all just to say that, oh, yeah, I think I was just saying that if you're watching that, this is not how we do it every Sunday, you know, just a little <laughs> off today. 
I'm just saying that everyone can play dead, but if I try to play dead, the enemy will definitely devour me. I think that's what I was... Job says in Job chapter 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You might be going through a difficult season. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Trust God. Put your hope and your trust in God. I cannot guarantee that it will turn out the way you want it to turn out, but I can guarantee that God is with you and he will see you through it. As we come to the end of this sermon, there's a quote here I wanted to read, and I somehow, okay. If you've read the book, um, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, one of my favorite, I love The Count of Mon- Monte Cristo. You can, you can watch the movie. There is a quote there, and this quote is my life quote. I've always loved this, and do your worst is actually from there. In the story, Edmond Dantes declares, life is a storm, my young friend. You will bask in the sunlight one moment, be shattered on the rocks the next. What makes you a man is what you do when that storm comes. You must look into that storm and shout as you did in Rome. Do your worst, for I will do mine. Then the fates will know you as we know you, as Albert Mondego, the man. The storms will come. The storms will do their worst, but your God is with you. If we can all be on our feet. Whatever you're going through today, I just want us to just, we're not going to pray and say, God, please, 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 if you can turn this around, no. I want you to go to your father with confidence because he's your father. When my son wants me to give him something, he doesn't come, Dad, if you can, you know, if you want to. Like, Dad, can I have this? Best best your dad can do is say, no, I got something better. Do you lose anything? But he says, call upon me. Come to me. He says, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. What's the worst that can happen? No, I got something better. We prayed for healing for Chelsea, and God said, no, I got something better. Why? Because one day you and I, we're going to unite in eternity and celebrate the goodness of God and not think about this life anymore. They say everybody wants to see Jesus, but nobody wants to go. (laughs) Nobody wants to go. Folks. Whatever you're going through, I want you to look into the storm right now. As they play, as they play don't, don't think about anybody here. The Spirit of God is here. And there are angels here. I want you to look at the problem face on. It could be an addiction that you're experiencing right now. And I believe some people are going, addiction chains are going to be broken today. It could be a marriage that is struggling I believe God is able to turn things around. Whatever storm it is, it could be disappointment. It could be an abuse from childhood that has traveled from a young age right into your future. Today, I want you to look at it and say, you've done your worst. My God has overcome you. My God has overcome you. And today, I am set free from all these bondages. Today, whatever problem that is going on, I look at you and in the power and the authority in the name of Jesus. Cease and desist in the name of Jesus. I want you to stop praying, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Don't, 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 think, about the, don't, don't think about the prayer. Pray it out. I want you to pray it out. There's something powerful about praying out. God didn't think the world into being. He spoke it into being. There's power behind our words. Lord, we thank you for Lighthouse, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your blessings and your promises over Lighthouse, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all the good words that you have spoken to us. And Lord, even though we are grieving and, we, we, and, and it looks like we're in the middle of a storm, Lord, 
we will not let it put us down. Lord, we stand and look at the storm and say, do your words, for our God will do his. Our God, strong and mighty, has overcome you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what you are doing. Lord, I thank you that chains are being broken right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that addictions are being broken right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for restoration that is coming to struggling marriages here and now, right now, in the name of Jesus. I believe it so strongly. I, I hear it. Rekindling of marriages. Yes, I hear it. Rekindling of marriages. I know you are doing it, Lord. Lord, the storms in our lives have no power. They have no power. Yet though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us, oh Lord. You are with us. You are with us, Lord. You are with us, Lord. Lord, we pray for strength. We pray for favor. And we thank you for deliverance from the hands of the enemy, Lord. We thank you, God, that the, that the plans of the enemy against each individual here has failed in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that the plans of the enemy have failed in the name of Jesus. We thank you for strength to stand. Even when our, our lives and our world seems to be crumbling, thank you for the strength and the power to stand in boldness and in confidence, knowing that when we look at the end of this book, we win. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Lord, you win. And that's what we believe, Lord. Lord, this is how we fight our battles. Not in fear. Not cowering. But standing straight and firm, looking at the storm. Knowing that the course of our lives are being charted by Jehovah. That's what we know and that's what we believe. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, as we come to the end of the service today, I pray, Lord, that everyone here is encouraged. That, Lord, nobody goes back and returns to their problems, Lord. Because, Lord, it is not their problems. It is a problem, but it is not their problem. Why? Because your word says that we should come to you. You say all those who are, who are broken, who are weary, who are carrying loads, we should come to you, Lord. Therefore, Lord, we lay everything at your feet. We lay them all at your feet. Lord, I pray that people will leave here today with heaviness lifted. Lord, I pray especially for those who are battling anxiety and depression right now. Lord, I pray that that weight is lifted, Lord, in the name of Jesus. That it is removed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And at this point, if the, if the uh, prayer team and the elders can come up, if there's anything you want us to pray about for you, if there's anything you want to talk about, the prayer team will be here, and we would love to talk with you, would love to pray for you. And we know God will move in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God, I pray that you will bless and keep us all. Lord, shine your face upon us and help us be on mission for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how